Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Sussex Azure User Group podcast. Uh, we are at episode 23. Can you believe it, Ryan? It's been a long, long old journey. Yeah, we're getting there, right? And uh, it's going to be interesting how things progress for the user group as we come out of lockdown. Hopefully, we'll start to um, do some of the face to face um sessions in brighton that, that this whole group started off as right so uh, i'd like to think that you know we'll keep on with the podcast as well time permitting but uh people in sussex be great to see you soon when things start to open up absolutely like i don't think we can all wait to get back to in-person events right i know that you know something that a lot of people are missing um our venue certainly changed a lot like even though we haven't been there like you know if any of you have made it down to the the skiff in brighton where we host it um they only have upstairs now due to the pandemic you know we've had to they had to resize and you know cut the cut the cost of the building but you know we still got plenty of space to have you know probably up to 100 people in there so yeah looking forward to getting back to those in-person events when we can get there i think maybe we'll be nearer christmas when, we're, when we're, that happens but you know let's let's see when, when we get there fingers crossed it's earlier than that um yeah, so, so as, this as week, always i was just gonna say jack as always there'll be beer and pizza so if there's any reason to come join us that's a good enough reason right there's no better invite than beer and pizza right you said it now <laughs> we're gonna have to order like you know we're gonna have to stock out the local papa john's and dominoes just to make sure that they're ready um but yeah no absolutely come and join us when those are there and we'll be sure to share links and make sure that everybody's aware when they're first starting to come back um but yeah this week we sort of following on from our last podcast which admittedly hold our hands up is a little while ago uh, we've both been pretty busy um and you know had other things on our plate but this is uh talking around resiliency in azure right so how how do you make your applications resilient how do you you know what's an sla what's an rto what's an rpo all of those sort of things so following on from our uh, well architected framework discussion we had with chris um on the last episode and chris will be back like chris is going to come back and do another episode with us um but you know we're just trying to schedule that in right now so um ryan should we, should we get into we put some slides together right for this one today because uh, it's easy to talk yeah. about with a diagram yeah i'm just going to say in the scene really i've wanted to do a um like a, a business continuity or resilience um session for a while because i it, it's quite easy to assume that like, by running something or moving something to the cloud, because it's a, you know, it's, it's a Microsoft managed data center effectively, you know, can you just chuck something in there and it's, although it's not your responsibility, is it just going to be there and always be up and, and how does resiliency work? And, and this is something that both Jack and I talk to customers about quite a lot is whilst the platform has got to be resilient from a, from a hardware level and up, you still have to design resiliency into the workloads and you know, things that you're running in Azure, depending on your business needs. So we've put together um, a bunch of slides. Well, we've put together, Microsoft have put together a bunch of slides. Uh, we're not going to take credit for all of these. Um, but um, we just wanted to show in terms of what is your responsibility when you spin up a new workload in Azure and what you need to be aware of when you have to make something like, if you've got a business critical application, what do you need to be aware of and how do you make that? Resilient and some of the on-prem, you know, methodology and um, practices from, you know, from, from the past couple of decades, really, in terms of how things have been built on-prem, they still carry over to cloud, but in a slightly different way. There's a lot of nuances that, that we thought we'd point out. So, as Jack said, we we've got slides, but um, if you're listening on audio, we'll try and tailor it to be, you know, hopefully useful without the slides. But um, yeah, let's see how we go. Yeah, if not, and definitely check out the show notes. We'll leave a link to the YouTube video in the podcast show notes so that if you, you know, you're on a device where you can click on that link and watch straight away, you'll be able to jump in and, and watch it from there. Now, before we start, Ryan, we are both guilty of this. We we love this topic and it's something we 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 talk about quite a lot. So I've got a timer on my desk. Um, Good idea. and what we're gonna do is we're gonna set a 30 minute timer and we're gonna try and keep it below that. All right. So 30 minutes is on the clock. We are we are right. off. Um if right. you hear a beep in 30 minutes, we've overrun. <laughs> um so let, let, let's go for it so with that that's let a me really good this. idea i think yeah <laughs> this, this, this topic alone could easily go on for three hours so yeah good idea. exactly let's uh so let's get into the slide so uh hopefully those of you are viewing can now see the slides that we're sharing so um how do you know we we approach this? So I think first of all, there's some there's some really fundamental terms that you need to sort of understand sort of as a level set before we go any further. So um, there's a few terms that you've probably heard of before, but we put a like sort of a, a small a definition here. So service level agreements are something that you've heard of quite a lot, or SLAs as they're referred to quite commonly in the industry. Um, and these really just 
describe the commitment from that provider of what their uptime is going to be to for for that service to work as it as they say it's going to basically. So in Azure, um, how long a VM is going to be online? What we're going to commit to for a VM being online and available and able to connect to, right? I, I, just on that, SLAs can be measured in quite different ways in different industries and in different worlds. In Azure, we're talking about how long a service is up for, it's a year, isn't it, Jack, in, in terms of percentage? Uh, it's monthly, all done on a monthly percentage. Sorry, Sorry my mistake. Yeah, so, so monthly. So um, if you've got a virtual machine and um, there's an outage in Azure for, uh, say, an hour, that affects the percentage of how long that machine is running for in that month, right? And outages can be defined as, you know, customer, you know, you might, do something that, that affects the uptime of that VM, or there may be a platform issue from, from the Azure side, which which incurs a, a period of downtime. So just wanted to cover that. Yeah, absolutely. And it's really important to note that all of the SLAs in Azure um, are published on the on the Azure SLA website. So if you type in Azure SLA into to Google, you'll find the uh, the website and you'll be able to find the detail of each of those into sort of the legal depths. Um, but they're very easy to read. I will say that it's quite easy to get an understanding. Um, and the SLAs are different across all of our services and depending on how you've architected it, which we'll get onto later in, in this episode. Um, we've then got something called RTO, right? And this is probably more of a probably more commonly known in like a DR scenario or BCDR scenario. Um, so recovery time objective, um, it's the maximum acceptable time that your application can be unavailable after something's happened. So I don't know, yeah. say uh, an Azure region goes offline, it's the max duration that that can happen before you need to do something, before you breach your RTO. So, so RTO always puts me in mind in like on-prem world of a VMware cluster, right? You know, you might use um, Site Recovery Manager or Veeam or something like that to replicate a virtual machine to another um, data center. You might have storage replication or something like that. You might, yeah, uh, replicated storage devices with with infrastructure on. If you see an outage and you have to flip over, you know, you might see time to spin up virtual machines, changing DNS, doing some network config um, to make that service available in another data center. So think of that um, in, in Azure world, um, exactly the same applies. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and RPO moving on goes hand in hand with RTO, right? So we've got recovery point objective, which is um, how much data loss can you have since that disaster happened? So sometimes this is really low. Sometimes this might be, you know, actually, we can survive a day. It's not that important. Um, but, you know, it's defining how much data loss you can have during or, or based on that period. So when that incident happens, what's the furthest you can go back in time to restore the service? Um, it's it's got... really important to, sorry, Jack, it's, it's really important to think about that with a realistic uh, mindset because I've worked with customers that I've asked them, what's your recovery point objective? And, you know, you can put money on, if they've not thought about this before, they will say, well, zero, we can't lose anything. But you've got to think about the, you know, the, the mechanics behind, you know, what you need to do to get to that zero RPO. And it's quite hard to achieve. A lot of financial institutions will have a zero RPO because they cannot tolerate any loss. Um, but if you've got something like, um, you know, take for example a file server, and you're backing that up every day with a standard backup tool set. That RPO is technically 24 hours, right? Because it's the yeah. longest period of time until that backup cycle's run. Um, to a lot of people, that's acceptable. You can use a, lose a day of, of data. People may run backups, you know, four or five times a day to reduce that RPO. So it's just important to, to keep that in mind when you're when you're trying to define this stuff. Everything in this world has a price, right? And the, the better you want, the more you pay. So, like, you know, that's a good rule no. to keep in mind. Um, we've then got a couple that are, are not new to me, but some something you don't hear too often. So you've got something called MTTR, so a mean time to recover. Um, and it's, it's sort of similar to RTO in a way. It's sort of the average time it takes to restore a component after something's failed. So it's not the same as an RTO, but it's very similar. So it's more of a, you know, what does it actually take? Like when you do this, like what's a rougher estimate of doing it? Whereas an RTO is a target, uh, MTTR is more of a realistic estimate of what, when that's, that, that and, actually takes. And, and MTTR can be a, a, a technical thing and a people thing as well. So it might be if you have to manually invoke DR, if, it, if you have to do it in the middle of the night and half of your team are asleep and you've got to wake up somebody to go and invoke that DR process, that would be included in that MTTR as well. 
people factoring in like cold glasses of water next to bedside cabinets to throw over people <laughs> to try and wake people up. I'm just imagining people have lowering their MTTRs now. Um, <laughs> and then we've got uh, MTBF, so mean time between failures. So uh, how long a component can reasonably expect to last between outages. So some applications have built in fault tolerance and be expecting failures. How long can they last without you know that service that's failed offline basically? So you might have a queuing system or a messaging system that can queue up and store messages. Um, you know, like think of when uh, WhatsApp goes down or something like that, but you've sent a load of messages, right? Actually, when the service is restored, all your messages will go through. So, you know, that's a good way of how long can it last without, you know, filling up the queues of all your messages being sent. And actually, I can't take any more messages. Um, you know, that's a good way to think about MTBF. And I think, Ryan, you touched on this, the, the bottom point we've got in black here about the importance of defining these metrics. Um, you know, do you want to just elaborate a little bit more on that that section? Yeah, absolutely. So, um it's, it's mainly around setting up expectations, right? If depending on what your, your business or your customer does, um, you need to define exactly what it means to, to set these, these different metrics, right? Um, Jack hit on quite a good point of, it, it costs more money to, to have better metrics on, on RPO, RTO, MTTR and all the rest of it. Um, if you are running a business critical workload, you need to invest in terms of making it resilient. You know, having a customer facing application that your business is all built around uh, on a single virtual machine in a single storage account is probably not a good idea. So um, the business conversation comes first and then the technology alignment comes to support those requirements. It's, it's probably something to highlight here. Yeah, and I think going back to our last episode with Chris, I think Chris made a re it's, a it's a balancing act, right? Or it's like, you know, robbing Peter to pay Paul almost. Like you, you can have the best of everything, but you're going to pay for it. And sometimes you'll need to balance that against the cost and the actual value that that brings back to your business. You know, having your file server that stores your archive of documents, for example, online 24-7, never going down, having an RTO and RPO of zero will cost you a lot of money and is technically achievable, but actually, what value does that bring to your business on your bottom line if it was offline for, say, an hour or a day? Probably not that much. So actually, your RTO and RPO and all those other metrics don't need to be as high. Um, but, you know, something to keep in mind, and we'll definitely go into more detail on those. Yeah, so, so on that point, so if you want to move to the next slide, Jack, we've got some, um, and we'll call these out for people listening on audio, some examples of where these availabilities may sit. So 99% SLA of of availability so going back to what we spoke around about that month of uptime um you might have a something like a, a batch processing job or you've got something that does like a schedule F, ftp transfer or something like that that just happens in the background it's procedural but because it's only happening on a schedule and not frequently you might be able to take that system down and back up again and, and it doesn't really matter so much it's not going to affect too much so, so therefore you could you don't need so so much rigor around keeping that surface up because you can take it down and do maintenance and it's not going to really impact your business, for example. All the way up to the top of the stack in here where we've got things like ATM, ATM transactions or telco systems, you know, you might have something that um, serves a lot of users, right? So take something like an ISP. Uptime is, is what effectively they're, they're measured on and that's how they keep their customers. If, if an ISP or a mobile phone operator has an outage, People complain about it. It goes straight on Twitter. It's like, you know, I won't name any brands actually, but, um, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's very, very visible. And that's why you would want, you know, a very, very well-defined SLA for those services and a very, very short RTO and RPO if you do see an outage. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, just to call out some of those others in between. So like if you went up from 99% to like 99.9%, um, you know, that might be something that is it's fairly important, like a SharePoint site or something like that. Like it's nice to have online all the time, but it's not vital to the business's operation to be online all the time. Um, moving up through to 99.95, you might say, you know, that's like a EPOS system. So like taking cash or something like that, like it's, it's pretty important that it stays online, but actually there's ways and methods around it. You might have multiple yeah. of those or you might have, you know, go back to pen and paper for, for times that, you know, where card machines go down, you know, those sort of things. Um, and then to 99.99% where you might see typical like things like video delivery or like this podcast, how you're listening to it. Like it's really important that that's available most of the time and like things like YouTube or online, but actually 
the world won't end if it goes offline. So you don't need to have the ultimate availability for something that's critical. That's a really good measure, actually. You know, is if this service goes down, what impact does it have to your business? Can you operate in different ways? Will people wait a small amount of time till it comes back up? Um, or is it absolutely mission critical to the core of your business? And you know, in, in some cases, will you will you get financial penalties if you don't provide this service for what you're contracted to do? And and that's that's a key point actually. SLAs can be built into contractuals. And anybody that consumes Azure, for example, we have public SLAs that say we guarantee that these we will meet this SLA. Otherwise, you can be reimbursed in terms of credits and something like that if you if you see a big downtime, depending on what type of agreement that you have. Um, you know, a good example might be like uh, something like Spotify or Apple Music. If you're if if you listen if you use their service a lot, say they had a downtime for a day. You know, that would be catastrophic for them. And they would probably want to think about, well, how do we make this up to our users? Because they've significantly breached their SLA. I'm sure they don't have anything in their SLA that says that, but that, that's an example of how they, they could um, work around that contractually. Yeah, and I think that's, you touched on a really nice point there, actually, that, you know, you, generally you, somebody who's building a service like Spotify or Apple Music are relying on somebody else to deliver that service, right? Or multiple other partners and vendors, you know, they may run on uh, Azure, they may run on AWS, they may run on loads of different cloud platforms or their own internal systems, but all of those have an SLA that they're trying to meet. And therefore, if you're building a service on top of these, it's really important to understand what the SLAs are being guaranteed to you, because say you're, you've got a you know, you're running it on prem and you can get an 80% SLA, right, of uptime, but then you commit to your new customer for your service of 100% SLA. Well, you're setting yourself up to pay out on refunds because your platform isn't up to the standards to deliver that. And I think that's worth keeping in mind as well when you're designing systems that actually, what are you offering to your customers? Sometimes that actually might dictate what you have to deliver. So speaking to legal and, and compliance teams is generally a thing that happens in these discussions as well. Absolutely. I, I touched briefly on, you know, what does this availability metric mean? And if we skip on to the next slide, Jack, we've got some um, kind of meaningful information, exactly the downtime that you would expect based on these SLA, right? So um, the smallest SLA in, in Azure, um, so far as I'm aware, is 95% uptime, mm -hmm. um, which is a single VM and a standard spinning disk hard disk. Um, yeah. In this graph, we've, sorry, in this table, we've, we're going from 99% upwards, but a 99% um, SLA on a virtual machine is a single VM with uh, standard SSD storage, Jack? Yeah, I think it's it's 99.5, actually, for standard SSD, so which we haven't got on here either. But you, it's, you, I think the point you're trying to get across here is, you know, it's a... Uh, giving you and putting context around those numbers rather than it just being a 99 and with a load of nines after it. Exactly. You know, somebody might say to you, well, what does that mean? You know, if 99% if, if uptime to me sounds awesome. But if you look at the metrics, that's um, 7.2 hours of downtime per month, which is actually quite a lot. You know, if, if, yeah. if you're taking a service offline to seven hours a month, that's a lot. And then we've got right up to the other end of the scale, five nines. So 99.999% of uptime is only 25 seconds of downtime a month. Yeah, seven point two hours. Like if Feb February is a bad month for SLAs, I'm going to call out right now. Like you've got less <laughs> days, or, or a good thing, right? You've got less, less or more days. Depends on the side of the fence you sit on. But yeah, it's it's important to put that context context around it. And when you certainly in my customer discussions, when they go, well, well we need a hundred percent SLA, and you're like, well, okay do you really need it that like can you live like and quite commonly like 99.9 99.95 is generally where we find yourself like can you live without a service for say 43 minutes a month and they're like do you know what we probably could it wouldn't be great but we probably could and these aren't yeah. things saying like we're gonna have 43 minutes of downtime months but that's what we're saying as a oh. provider that's what rsla is and that's what we're, we're aiming to achieve as a bare minimum that's, that's a good point. I was going to say that downtime metric is not a target. It's a worst case scenario. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. We're not planning. We're not going to just turn off all your VMs to, but, to make sure you get 43 but, minutes of downtime. But that's why typically they're financially backed because they're, they're saying to you as a consumer, worst case scenario, this is going to happen. If it goes beyond that, you might get some financial compensation in some way. And that's how we're standing against that SLA. Because if people breach them all the time, you know, you just be a crappy provider, basically. So, yeah. yeah.
Absolutely. So, yeah, so there's some good context there. And these are taken directly from the well-architected framework uh, reliability uh, pillar site. So um, we'll leave some links in there in the show notes, as always, and on the podcast site. Go and check them out. But these are fairly standard. Also, a shout out to there's a nice little website called uptime.is, I think it is. Um, and it's literally the most basic website you've ever seen in your life. But you put in the SLA in terms of 99.9 or 99.9999 um, and hit go. And it will tell you in days, months, years, wh- whatever you need to know it in, what that actually translates to. So um, we'll leave a, a link in the show notes to that as well because it's quite handy. Um, but, yeah, worth keeping in mind. So moving forward, um, we... This is, you know, I think you raised this point right at the beginning, Ryan, in terms of, well, we're putting our stuff in Azure, it's all taken care of, right? And that actually isn't the case. And we talk about this quite a lot with customers on their cloud journey. It's it's a shared responsibility model, right? And we'd love to find the pizza slide. Um, we, we dug around for a long time for the pizza slide, but we couldn't find it. So um, it's, it's your application. You know how it works. You know how it's built. Um, you know what it can live with, what it can't live with, without. without. Um, you're then building that on Azure and, you know, Azure has various different tactics um, to help you achieve a better SLA. So we'll talk about things later about availability sets, availability zones, Azure site recovery, all of these things that, you know, exist in the platform to help you make a more resilient service. And then actually, you know, you're building it on top of Azure anyway, you know, our data centers, we factor in these from more of a physical and power and network and cooling perspective that we aren't actually having, you know, single power feeds into buildings and data centers. You know, we're, we're taking that element off to make sure that we're, we're making that as resilient as possible. And then our SLAs are built on top of that. Now, I think there's a lot of words here, right? And it's, it's easier seeing pictures sometimes. So um, what we do now is throw up the, the typical uh, model that you, uh, probably a lot of you have seen around what, what you manage, what we manage and how it all works between on-premise and uh, software as a service. And love it when that happens. There we go. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think, you know, on-prem, you, you look after everything, right? You look after everything from the building to the power to the cooling to the servers to the apps that's on top of them, right? But as you move forward in this cloud model, that, that shared responsibility model changes. It's, yeah, one thing that this this diagram misses out is that, power, building, air conditioning, security of the building. Um, you know, that is another thing that you have to think about on premise. Everything in Azure you don't, obviously that, that stuff is completely handled as a service, um, as you'd expect. Um, uh, but moving on to that infrastructure as a service um, column, the second one in, um, Moving to, and this is quite a good argument for cloud, right? Because in an on-prem data center, you'd need to probably install firewalls, switches, and connect them together and configure them and, and look at um, racking hosts and running some kind of hypervisor if you're virtualizing it, things like that. So all of that stuff in cloud is taken care of for you. Um, if you think like a traditional Hyper-V host or a VMware host, and you just log in and, and consume that and somebody else looks after all of that infrastructure for you. IaaS is a very similar thing. You log into the Azure portal, you can build up your own VM. Anything within that VM though, you're responsible for. So you need to make sure it's patched. Any data that you put on that VM, you you need to make sure that it's backed up in some way. Whilst the platform will stay up, you need to make sure that if somebody came and deleted that data, you've got some kind of safety net for it, right? Or the application that you put on it with a third party vendor, you have got a plan for patching that, fixing it if it goes wrong um, and everything else. And also like cumulative updates for the operating system. Um, that's something that you need to manage as well. So the IaaS um, thing is for a lot of people, the fact that Microsoft are looking after the bare metal tin and the security and, and all that piece is a compelling enough reason to move to cloud because it's, it's quite a lot of work, right? I, I remember both Jack and I, we've been in data centers together, physically changing disks, doing um, data center exits to another location where we've got to unwrap stuff and, it, and it's days and days of work, it's impact, it's risk and everything else. And to pay for that as a service takes a lot of burden off you and your IT team. And also just to think of, you know, from an SLA perspective, right? So you mentioned something going into a data center is a lot of risk, right? You know, I've been in a data center before and then you get a call on your mobile and like, what are you doing? And you're like, well, nothing. Like I'm nowhere near the rack. I'm actually getting a coffee. They're like, well, it's all just, something's just broken. You're like, well, it's not me. 
we Microsoft factor that into the SLAs, right? Obviously, there are operations that go on inside of data centers all day, every day, you know, putting new kit in, maintenance, all that stuff that happens. We're factoring that into the SLAs as well in terms of, well, actually, you know, if something is to happen, that's part of the SLA and we're, we're factoring that in. So, you know, it's important to think about all these things that build up to for companies to provide an SLA. A lot of calculations gone into this, especially in, in software and, and sort of um, vendors and data center hosts, because, you know, effectively they did a bad job of it. They ended up paying out a lot of money, I think, as you alluded to earlier, Ryan. Um, and obviously, as you move through the, the, the model, right, platform services, th there's less for you to worry about. As always, you more worry about the app and the data that you're running on it. Um, and then all the way through to that software as a service model, thinking, you know, Office 365, Microsoft 365 stack, you do nothing but consume that platform, right? The only thing really in there that you worry about is data. Yeah, a platform as a service, a key example, or, or an easy example of that is something like Azure SQL Database, right? You don't have to build a SQL server, you don't have to license it, you don't have to feed and water it, and you don't have to engineer it for scale and resilience. Azure SQL Database does that natively as part of that platform, but what you need to do is bring your SQL databases to it and your data, and you need to architect how your applications connect to that SQL database. That's a good example of has. Yeah, absolutely. And right. And those things still aren't, you know, resiliency is sort of covered within uh, certain services um, from a platform perspective. But actually, they you might need a higher SLA than what it offers out of the box. And therefore, you need to architect with that in mind, like maybe making it AZ re resilient or maybe deploying it across multiple regions. Right. But stuff we'll get into in a, in, in a couple more slides. But just really important, like it, just because you're putting it in a cloud or any other provider that gives you an SLA doesn't mean that you haven't got to think about these things. You still absolutely absolutely got to cover these things off. It's a shared yeah. model. Good point. Yeah, you know, PaaS, going back to that SQL database analogy, it's got different levels, right? It's got business critical. Business critical? Yeah, business and general purpose. Yeah, and general purpose. You know, you may put a mission critical database in one of the lower tiers and uh, something happens to an Azure region and suddenly you've got a huge outage on your hands. So you might think, well, I put that in PaaS. You know, it should be all dealt with for me. But actually, you need to tear up and make sure that you're in a business critical tier that's replicating that database to another availability zone or another Azure region just to cover yourself off against failures, which, let's be honest, do happen in IT. Yeah. Uh, what do they say? Well, if you plan, plan to fail, uh, or, or to fail to prepare yeah fail, fail to prepare prepare to fail like all that sort of That's stuff it. right it's, it's absolutely true um you've got to think of these things when you're designing a system um so we've talked a lot about the the theory and the the that side of things i think actually let's get into some of the issue and some of the techie stuff right where, where we actually focus so we've talked around all these different concepts of availability zones and availability sets and all of these different bits and pieces so let's actually just build out this slide and talk over it so for those of you uh listening in i would highly recommend tuning into the video at this point just to uh, see this slide because it's one that you may have seen before um but it's um very easy to, to help your customers understand what's going on and you know even if you're you're not you are a direct customer this is makes it all come together and make a lot of sense so we talked around earlier that um the the sort of base level of uh sla for a single vm with premium storage uh so premium ssd disks managed disks attached is 99.9 percent .9%, and that translates to something like i think it's like 43 minutes of downtime a month or something like that um don't quote me on the numbers I, I, i'm doing that off the top of my head but you know we, we showed them on an earlier slide um we actually have two tiers below that for single vms now as well so as ryan mentioned if you've got a single vm with standard hdd discs attached you get a 95 percent sla um that got announced i want to say like the back end of last year like it was something it was, wasn't very big big announcement but it, it came out we, we had an sla and also if you have a, a single vm with standard ssd discs you get a 99.5 percent sla so i think we're the only cloud that offers an sla on a single vm with standard hdd disc you know magnetic spinning 7.2k you know so 15k yeah. sort of sas drives right which is which is really great to see um it, it is good to see and it, it's, it's impressive really because if you think what a single vm is it's quite hard to engineer resilience into something that is a single entity if something happens to the operating system or the underlying host that's running it you know you can't spread it across multiple hosts if it's if it's running and live um the fact that there is that sla and, it, and, it, and you can you know from what jack explained purely on storage right so premium storage is spread across multiple appliances storage appliances to, to make that 
uh, more available. But um, there's only so much you can do when you're looking at a single virtual machine. So like I said at the beginning, don't just put a workload on a single VM and say, oh, I'll be all right, it's in the, in the cloud. They'll make sure it's up all the time. Um, think about the mechanics involved in keeping that VM. And if any, it's, it's quite high risk because if anything does fail, you either have to spin it up on a different host within the same data center or region or in a completely different region, depending on, on what's hit that VM. Yeah, absolutely. So I think moving on nicely from that, don't have a single VM, you know, what, what's the next step? So your next step up in Azure is using something called availability sets, which are available in all regions, whether they've got availability zone support or not. Um, and what that does is affect, it's like affinity sets, right, is the way I always explain this, like VMware or, or Hyper-V, um, where you have two VMs. So let's say you've got two web servers right now. So you had one web server, you wanted to improve your SLA to 99.95%. So you deployed another web server, put the same website on it. It's exactly the same. It's almost a clone. Um, but And you've got like a load balancer in front of them, right? So the traffic's going to both of them. With availability, availability sets, we ensure that they're not on the same rack, basically. So they're running on different hosts, different racks, so they can't be impacted by the same same outage that happens to a single single host. Um, and what we that, that SLA then guarantees is connectivity and uptime of a single VM or to the service. So it could be two VMs, it could be you know fifty VMs in the same availability set, but we're guaranteeing you connectivity to the service that you put inside of that availability set, not to each of the VMs. So you could lose a VM. But because one of them is still online providing the service, the SLA is still being met, so we're not going to pay out on that. Yeah, and um, yeah, I've seen it so many times where people have built a like a web farm, haven't configured availability sets, and then there may be uh, you know a, a, an upgrade window or, or or a failure, and the whole lot goes down because it's all sitting on the same rack, all on the, all on the same host. Um, and you know they'll come to me and say, Ryan, what, you know, why did we get this outage? We we spread our eggs across all of these VMs. And the key there was availability sets. Yeah, so, absolutely. So taking that kind of concept of spreading your virtual machines across multiple racks, multiple hosts, you can go one step further um, and use something called availability zones. So if you think about a traditional data center, you'll have a floor or multiple floors of racks and racks and racks with hosts and hosts and hosts. Of, you know, completely filling that, um, which is great. And you could spread those VMs across different racks. But what if something happened to that building? You know, what, what if there was a power outage or, or an ISP or a network outage that meant that, or, you know, heaven forbid, a plane hit that building or there was some kind of huge natural catastrophe, a flood or something took out that building in some way? How do you design against that? So this is where the concept of availability zones come in. Um, if you think about an Azure region, um, they're huge, right? You know, we, we can put some pictures in the show notes in terms of, we should have included it actually, in terms of what an Azure region looks like. It's not a single building. It's a multiple building spread out a vast space. And we categorize buildings or groups of those buildings as availability zones. So typically you're presented with three different zones that's not kind of hard aligned to different buildings. It actually gets randomized for each different Azure subscription. Um, but effectively, what you can say is, I want to have one of my, the same example, one of our web, web VMs in zone one, another one in zone two, and another one in zone three. And that's spreading it across these buildings. And um, Microsoft actually engineer you know, the, the networking, and everything between those buildings to allow your application or whatever you're running to stay alive across those, those three data centers within a single region. Yeah, and I think availability zones, right? So um, the network you touched on there is, you know, super low latency between availability zones. So you, if you're into SQL and database technologies, you can even still do synchronous commits in across availability zones, right? The latency is, you know, I think on average, I don't see it much above two milliseconds, right? Like if ever, I don't think I've ever really seen it above two milliseconds to be honest um so you know you can really get some low latency and treat it as the same data center effectively but actually know in the in the background it's spread across different buildings separate power separate calling separate isp fees all of that stuff you know is taken care of and actually all you've done is spread your workload across it and uh, the nice thing is your, your virtual network spans across all of those three availability zones and all your subnets as well so you yep. literally can treat it from an azure perspective as the same network, the same building, but actually when you're deploying those virtual machines, that's the beep, right? That's 30 minutes, that's how, that's how bad yeah, we're doing. 
<laughs> we might need to break make this into a two part episode. Um, Possibly. But yeah, exactly right. So you got availability zones, and you can use different buildings and different. Um, you have the same virtual network span across those, which is really nice from a sort of an architecture perspective because you haven't got to consider multiple address spaces, routing, and all that stuff. It's the same flat network across all. Um, and then I think to to take it uh, even one more step further is then, well, what happens if all of those uh, availability zones within that region are all impacted by the same thing, which I don't think we've ever seen happen yet, but never say never, you know, touching wood. Um, you know, how do we protect from that? You know, our app absolutely cannot go down ever. How do we protect ourselves? Well, that's where you'd use something like another region. So we have a concept of region pairing where, you know, UK South is paired with UK West. Um, West Europe is paired with North Europe. You know, you could use those or actually you could just pick any region. So I could say actually UK South, I want to have my backup region or my secondary region as West Europe. Um, and there's a m multitude of ways to architect for that. And I feel like that's something we need to touch on you know, in another episode about how you would architect for, for those sort of things. But actually using something like Azure Site Recovery, you can enable your VMs to replicate automatically to another region uh, all the time based on your RTO and RPO that you define. And then should a disaster happen in your primary region, you can push a button and it will spin up all the VMs in another region um, off and you know they'll start up and your service is back online providing you know you obviously put load balances in front traffic managers front door all of that stuff dns changes have taken place yeah. um but we can certainly dive into that in a lot more detail but, um but you know uh, that's that's something that happens an alternative to that to that example would be active active right so if you want to achieve a, a lesser sort of a more improved RTO and RPO, you basically would build a mirror infrastructure in another region. So yeah, it um, would massively lower your MTTR as well. It, it would, but unfortunately, that means double the cost because you're effectively building exactly the same thing twice. Um, I've worked with a lot of people where um, they've wanted to do that for resilience, but actually, when we introduced availability zones, they said, "Well, actually, that's that's achieving what I need to do in terms of geographical spread of my infrastructure." We don't need multiple entities of the same thing. Let's use availability zones, and that ticks all of those box boxes. And the SLA is, is good enough for our requirements. So don't discount availability zones for, for DR, because actually you can really simplify your infrastructure without having to build it twice and manage failover and all of that kind of complexity. When zones may give you everything that you need with a single network plane, as Jack described. Yeah, and I think just to reinforce that point as well, like Microsoft's commitment, I think if you watched uh, Ignite recently and you watched Mark Rosanovich's talk, um, we've committed that every new Azure region that we build going forward will have availability zones by default, right? So it's no longer, we might not have it. Um, and there's also a big roadmap to, you know, enable more regions to have availability zones, right? There's a massive push towards availability zones. AWS have availability zones in most of their regions. Um, you know, a lot of cloud providers are going down this pattern. And I think you're absolutely right, Ryan. Think of it from a data sovereignty perspective, you know, a UK bank or something like that, they can't have it in another country, right, for, for, for legal reasons. So actually, the only option they have got are availability zones in, in some scenarios. And actually, yeah, 99.99%. I think that's something like, I want to say like two minutes of downtime a month or something like that. I can't remember what, what, it, what it is, but it, it's no, very low. Four, four minutes 32. Four minutes 32 of downtime a month for your service. So that, that's not bad. Um, but, you know, that, that may not be enough for you sometimes. And there are other ways to do that. And you can get into building composite SLAs across multiple regions. But staying on that availability zone point, a lot of services are now enabling support for availability zone aware. So we, you talked about SQL database earlier, Ryan. You know, you can make that availability zone aware so that the database is across all three availability zones. Um, and if you see ZRS mentioned, so zone redundant storage, um, that's another new thing for store for, for the storage platform storage accounts where they are uh, three copies of your data are spread across those availability zones. So one copy in each. So a lot of services are enabling sort of out of the box support for availability zones effectively. Exactly. So let's um, let's dig into some of the architecture. Um, what, what does this look like in terms of um, so, say we take like a three tier application, right? You've got a web front end. An application stack and then a database on the back end. Let's look at how this translates to different design patterns for resiliency. So, in this example, um, Jack mentioned um, Azure Site Recovery, right? So, this is a this is a good way of depicting that. Um, 
So you've got your application, you've got your web tier, you've got your databases sitting on VMs or maybe PaaS services. Um, what you could do is enable ASR and it's super easy now. It's, it's integrated into the Azure portal. So you can go to a VM and say, I want to replicate this to another region. And it's like three clicks and it does it, sorts it out, everything, even provisions of the virtual network. Um, so what you can do is configure um, replication. And what it will do is it just replicates the disks to the other region. Um, so you're not paying for the compute or the uptime for any of these things while you're not in DR, but it is passive DR, right? They're, they're sitting there cold, not doing anything until you invoke DR. Um, the benefit of this is um, you're only paying for the storage. And if your um, RTO is relatively relaxed, this is a really good model. And actually this design pattern works um, especially well for on-prem data centers. So one of the first kind of dips into Azure that I've seen, and this is, you know, started years back and, and even to now, say you've got two data centers that you manage on-prem, one's active, one's passive, um, but you're, you've invested in hardware to sit there and run in the passive data center, not doing anything, waiting for that eventuality of when the primary one fails. It's quite an expensive model thinking retrospectively back, you know, it's a, you have to design for full capacity, but most of the time it's never ever used, right? So Azure's a really good um, passive DR center for your on-prem. You can use Azure Site Recovery to replicate all your primary DC VMs to Azure. All they'll do is sit in a storage account, not, not doing anything, and it will keep them up to date. If that primary data center goes down, you click the failover button in Azure, it will power up all those VMs. You might need to do some networking changes or some DNS changes, depending on how the application's accessed, but you've got a kind of a data center in a box just instantly sprung up there, and that's your passive region, that for all the other time that you haven't had to pay for um, because you haven't invoked DR. So super easy to implement, um, easy to fail over with some caveats, but um, it's kind of your first step into um, resiliency within Azure, either on-prem or within an existing workload. Yeah, and I think just to reinforce on the, the availability zone point that we were talking about earlier, that um, ASR now supports um, replication between availability zones as well. So say you can't live, move out of the UK, for example, and you're in UK cells, um, say you're all in zone one, all your VMs, you can actually now enable ASR to replicate to the other zones as well. So replicating to zone two and zone three. So enabling like any option that you can really think of now to replicate those VMs if they can't all be online at the same time in an active active deployment we're enabling lots of options for active passive now um and i think the the other point with um ASR is I think this was yesterday it got announced that it's now available when you create a new VM from the portal there's an option to enable ASR like literally as you create the VM now to tick a box and you can get started from there. So it's not even a thing you have to do after or can potentially forget. You're actually prompted as part of the portal experience to, to enable it, it straight from the start, which is great to see. Cool. So, yeah, let's move on from this one and go the, the correct way through these slides. Um, so you mentioned we've mentioned availability zones and obviously the, the need for it. And I, I don't I think if you take one thing away from this this episode, Availability zones are something you should be looking into and starting to make take advantage of by building your applications to spread across them, or even if it's for that active passive scenario to replicate between them, so that you, you know that necessarily haven't got to redesign your network, but actually you can get a better availability SLA or a better RTO and RPO by just taking advantage of availability zones. Um, and there you go. So you know we talked about this earlier. Availability zones are designed to meet less than two milliseconds from VMs to VMs within the same Azure region, which is great to see. So moving on to the next slide um, and building on that availability zone architecture, this is a really nice example of that three three tier um, application that spread over zones, right? So in that web tier, spread over three zones business tier also spread over three zones and the data tier um, spread over two SQL PaaS zones um, in this example um, and then using something like an Azure file storage for for a cloud witness that you can then you know I think we did another talk on LRS versus GRS versus RA GRS and everything else that cloud witness can then be made resilient within its own means right so um, yeah storage tiering is, is also a part of um, of this that, that we won't cover in too much detail, but 
Um, this is a nice example of how zones can be used for um, a single use case. You may recognize this architecture or something that you've already deployed, but you're not using zones. Um, and it's something that you can um, then look to retrofit later on. Absolutely. And I think, you know, with SQL, we could do a whole episode on SQL DR, right, in, in great detail, because it's different for IaaS, it's different for SQL Managed Instance, it's different for SQL PaaS um, or SQL DB, as, it, as it's known. You know, there's lots of different options there, the general purpose, the business critical tier. Um, you can get into always on availability groups. All of these things and different methods to make SQL highly available is a is an interesting topic in itself. So maybe something we'll, we'll look in the future. But you're absolutely right. You know, th all of this is inside a single virtual network, the same sub net as you'll see from here and also you know the, the application gateway the azure standard load balancer are all spread across a zone resilient right so they're built to withstand a zone failure so that traffic keeps flowing regardless of what happens to a zone yeah and um it's really easy to overlook that right if you had to replicate this in in, in your own data center on prem you know you it's basically you'd have to build three data centers have a resilient pair of load balancers in each. You've then got to sort out all the complex network routing between them. But in Azure, it's just, yeah, I want one of them. Tick a box that makes it so redundant. And it's all done. You know, it, it's so easy to take all that stuff for granted um, that uh, always think about the mechanics of what's going on in the back end. You know, it, it, it presents itself really nicely and cleanly in the portal, something that's just simple, really simple to enable. But, um, but yeah, I find it fascinating that you can just do that with a click of a button now. I'm just thinking about some of the data centers that me and you have designed and, you know, making it resilient within a single data center was enough effort on its own to then start yeah. doing this across multiple data centers synchronously, you know, because this is less than two milliseconds of latency, you know, it's phenomenal. Like you, you just spent an absolute fortune getting close to this. Yeah, agreed. And I think, you know, taking this, like how, how we spoke about this earlier, like how do you protect from a region, right? So say all three zones get impacted by something, big natural disaster, or you know, something happens to an entire country, right? And everything goes offline. The UK gets cut off um, and, you know, we have no connectivity to anywhere. Um, what do you do then? Well, you know, that's where we, again, ASR comes to the rescue. Um, or, you know, you could have deployed this in an active active fashion, as you mentioned earlier, Ryan, if you, you're willing to pay for it to reduce your, your RTO and your RPO and your, your MTTR. Um, but actually, in you know, if you, you want to keep your costs down, you could just use ASR to replicate all of these VMs to the other other region and, you know, just hit click the button to fail over and off you go and bring the service back up, make some DNS and network changes, and you're back online within, you know, a ma matter of minutes. Something I want to call out on this slide is it, it shows a traffic manager in the middle, which is our global kind of DNS load balancer um, that's managing the traffic from the internet to these regions. You could easily replace that with as your front door if you wanted to do active, active, or even active, passive, uh, and it would give you you know a lot more uh, feature rich and more control over that failover as well. So there's multiple options here, but this is kind of your blueprint really in terms of multi-region. Um, resilience yeah even global load balancer now right new feature that came out uh, i think the last ignite global load balancer fronting it all as well so yeah lots of options to go in right at the front of the access in your service um and you know there's obviously different price points and different feature sets that meet make one right for you but um you know asr i think is the key message here that if you want that active passive setup asr is a great service to look at to, to help you enable those scenarios um one key question that i think we always get asked ryan is so do I ASR my domain controllers? The answer is no. Correct. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. it's, it's, it's easy to do, right? Because you know a domain controller is a is a critical thing. Um, if you've worked with AD for a while, you know you've got the concept of AD sites, and they're bound to I, um, IP ranges or network subnets. Um, it becomes very complicated if you end up pairing a um, a domain controller that was on in a different region and then you've got to make all of your um cold services that are boot up talk to it just just don't do it you know I've, I've seen it try to be done and you can engineer it but for the cost of running a couple of vms in, a, in an availability set or an availability zone within a vm just spread your ad sites around and and do it uh, as ad is designed yeah, well, you know, what's the, what's the one of the common things like everything when everything breaks, what's it generally DNS, right? DNS is always the thing. So 
generally in most environments, people's domain controllers provide their DNS. Uh, and that's probably still true in, in Azure for a lot of uh, enterprise and corporate workloads where they've got the VNet configured to use the domain controllers for DNS. The one thing you, you don't want to be worrying about when you're trying to fail over an application is DNS working and Active Directory and authentication working. So for the small cost of running, you know, a couple of domain controllers, even run them on like, you know, just really small D series VMs. D series. Burst of all if VMs. you really wanted to go burst of all, go burst of all, right? If you really want to save on the pennies, absolutely. But, you know, running that versus the value of trying to restore a domain controller and get everything else back online, I think you'd probably shave a lot of time off your uh, MTTR by just having them there ready to rock and roll straight from day zero. Uh, also, having more domain controllers, you know, you, you've got less chance of something bad happening in AD that you can't recover from. Absolutely, you might have an outage on prem, or something bad happens as part of a an upgrade or something like that. You, it's it's spreading your eggs right across across multiple places, different AD sites. That just gives you further resilience. And the same goes um, because this is a supported architecture, although it's very not common. Um, very not common. You know what I mean. <laughs> uh, same goes for Exchange servers, right? You could build an Exchange server in a region if you had to control your own mail. Um, flow and, and that you might have a reason for that, or even a hybrid server as part of a migration. Typically, they can be deployed in Exchange in, in Azure um, for, for reason migration and to add resilience to a hybrid server because it's critical, um, to, especially if mail's being routed through it. But technically, you could replicate that to another region, but when it comes up, it's going to have a right nightmare trying to contact this previous domain controller and, and everything else. Um, just build another Exchange server. Um, it's it's going to save you a lot of pain, uh, and yeah, as Jack said, put it on a small a small lower cheaper tier VM uh, SKU or or size, and you could just scale it up if you had to invoke DR if you needed to. It's far easier than trying to fix a broken domain controller that's been uh, migrated. Especially when you've got no uh, console access to that VM as well, right? You know, you've got the serial console, um, but if you want to be diving into that, trying to repair an AD issue when you're trying to also fail over the rest of your business, fair play to you. But uh, I, I certainly wouldn't want to be in that boat. Um, and the other top tip I love to give in these scenarios is make sure you configure DNS correctly on your VNets because DNS runs the world. And as soon as DNS goes wrong, everything else breaks. Um, I have been in a data center that me and Ryan both designed and built and did work on. Um, and DNS may not have been configured correctly across the entire estate when we did a failover event. And that certainly bit into my time of bringing the services back online uh, afterwards. Yeah. So top tip, make sure DNS is configured correctly. Um, and when you've got domain controllers in both sites, there's no reason why you can't have your VNets in either region having listing all of your D uh, D DCs in both both regions, right? Obviously, you put the ones in the other region as a lower preference, but put them all in because actually, you you may have an instance where your domain controllers go offline, but actually, the the, the region's fine. It's just your DCs that have had an issue, and you don't need to fail over. You can just use the DCs in the other region. And also think of how you can add resilience with different technologies, right? We've got um, Active Direct Azure Active Directory Domain Services, which is a PaaS version of Active Directory but it will effectively um, build up a pseudo domain from Azure Active Directory. If you just need simple identity for your virtual machines to connect to a domain in Azure, that could be a good tick, right? And, and you don't have to feed and water VMs, right? You're consuming a PaaS service for Active Directory that could really simplify your architecture. So don't overlook replacements in Azure that, that could make your life easier. Same goes for the web tier in this example, we've got three VMs. It's a simple application or something that you could easily port over to um, a web app in app service. Um, that's going to make your life so much easier. And you can add in that resiliency with a click of a button rather than having to maintain you know, multiple VMs across multiple ACs. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think we'll, we'll definitely have some future episodes diving into those things about modernizing apps and the benefits of PaaS and all those different bits and pieces. But I think that's that's all we wanted to cover, right, Ryan? We, we've covered quite a lot on the resiliency section here. Hopefully we've we've given you a flavor of uh, what the difference is between, um, you know, a single VM, availability sets, availability zones, um, 
feel free to watch this back as many times as you like. You know, leave us some comments in the in in the chat. Um, ping us on Twitter. You know, happy to to come back to you and and talk about these further. Um, and if there's enough interest, we'll, we'll probably even do another episode on this. You know, and dive into some specific topics if uh, there's any out there that you want covered. Um, but yeah. yeah, with that, Ryan, anything to add? Yeah, just to kind of reinforce some of your points, Jared, is it's a huge subject, and that's why we kind of decided let's let's just just make sure we put that timer on because we could just talk about it for hours. But hopefully, it's not been information overload. But yeah, just reach out, share some of the different practices and different architectures. This isn't the the only way to to engineer resilience in Azure. You can do it multiple ways. This is just you know one of the pretty much standard ways you can do it on a very much focusing on IaaS. So yeah, please reach out, Inter interested to hear, but hopefully we've added some value and opened your eyes in terms of how to make your workflows resilient and keep, keep your stuff alive. Absolutely, and with that, I think we'll, we'll leave everybody for the evening and uh, yeah, catch you in the next one. Thanks everyone.